everybody. Welcome back to Benton Homestead. Today we are here at Benton Guest House with some summer updates. If you've been following our channel, you know that we've decided to be as open as we can possibly be with our whole process for immigrating to Japan, the visa, as well as the financial side of things. So we're going to take a look at a few things that we've purchased for the guest house since our last video talking about our initial expense. Since our guest house first opened in late November, we were opening right at the beginning of winter. So we knew all along that we were going to make most of these summertime purchases, but we put off the purchase as long as possible. So we only got our air conditioners installed about two months ago when things started warming up. And now we've just completed our full flip over to summertime guest house mode. The first big improvement that was absolutely necessary for running a guest house in hot, humid Japan is to install air conditioners in two of our three bedrooms. We had a local air conditioning professional out to assess our house and tell us how many units he thought that we would need for the guest house and we decided to do two of them as the bare minimum that we could get away with for this first summer to see how things go. And the reason we did that is because we are considering a subsidy that the local municipality offers for small businesses getting started and that we could use the subsidy for the remaining air conditioners needed moving forward but the subsidy isn't available until this fall. So obviously making sure that guests are comfortable is our highest priority because we want to maintain our five-star reviews moving forward. So we did extensive testing about how to keep each room at a comfortable temperature, determining what was too warm, what was cool enough, what would guests want who may or may not be familiar with summers in Japan, and how do we accomplish that goal easiest? And we determined that the kitchen and some of these general living spaces that are not sleeping rooms can stay cool enough with a combination of this vintage fan with or without the windows open, getting a nice breeze. And this fan on the bottom here, which is sort of like a swamp cooler, it cools the air by running it over a tank of water. So this one's nice because it can work as a regular fan or if you hit that button it will work as the uh, water cooling fan and actually cool down the room even though it's not like an air conditioning unit. And we picked this up for only 2,500 yen at the recycle shop. The air conditioner in this room keeps this room nice and cool as well as the living room over there if we keep these screen doors closed. So while it's only designed really to cool this one room, it's definitely working well keeping these two rooms really comfortable. Right now, I only have it on the fan setting and the room is staying really cool, but when guests arrive, I pop over a short while ahead of time and turn the air conditioning on to a temperature so it's really cool when they arrive, especially if they're riding bicycles here during the summer heat. The other room that we had an air conditioner installed is our western style bedroom suite and this also only has the fan function on right now but it's keeping it really comfortable while I'm here cleaning. We are a little anxious to get our first electric bill because everybody knows that electricity is really expensive in Japan. It's really nice that the units are both air conditioners and heaters Although this winter, we will most likely go back to be using primarily the kerosene space heaters because those are by far the most efficient and affordable. I also swapped our super heavy winter blanket for a nice thin summer blanket on the western style bed here, as well as added some soba pillows, which are going to help keep guests cool while they're sleeping. Even though there's more blankets stored in our bedding closet in the living room, than our guests could ever use in one visit, I decided to make things even easier for them and I used these cool vintage nesting baskets to store an identical thin summer blanket here in their bedroom just in case they wanted to grab something to be a tiny bit warmer. Of course, this is a little update that didn't cost anything. 
because we found these amazing nested baskets here in the house and I cleaned them up, but I had been using them over the winter to store throw blankets and house jackets for the guests in case they were chilly. Now it's for the summer. It does take a little bit of education to get our guests to understand that each room is individually temperature controlled. It seems like there's a little more of an understanding for that during the winter, maybe a little less so during the summer. So I'm doing my best to explain to people as they come here that it does just take a little bit of thought to keep things at a nice cool temperature, including keeping these doors closed so the cold air stays inside them and the warmer air stays in the less used rooms. Now this is the upstairs room and also my personal favorite room in our guest house. And we chose not to have an air conditioner installed in this room until we either do or don't get the subsidy this fall to install additional air conditioners. The thing about this room is that we can open the windows on both sides, including these massive windows over here, to get a really nice cross breeze that gets strengthened by this little fan here, and it can stay reasonably cool. Obviously, that's not going to work for everyone who stays here in the summer, but fortunately, the way that our house is designed, the bedding can be used in any room. The Japanese floor bedding is, you know, uh, multifunctional and easy to rearrange. So if guests choose not to use this upstairs bedroom because it's a little warm this first summer, that's totally fine. We're just going to play it by ear and see how it goes. An unexpected rearranging change that I had to make was to move this little desk space from the tatami room here around the corner into the room with hardwood floors. And that's for a number of reasons. Let me briefly explain. So we are still in the process of learning how to appropriately care for tatami mats. It is definitely a process. And I knew going into it that you're not supposed to set heavy things on tatami like permanent furniture. So I went through great effort to make sure that this desk didn't leave any permanent indentations in the tatami. I put some foam pads underneath it as well as this mat here so the chair itself didn't leave any wheel marks on the tatami and that was thankfully successful. But the little mat underneath the desk chair was not allowing these tatami mats to breathe during the humid summer and it was causing some issues. You can see where the tatami was covered with the mat. It was not fading and that's because Fresh tatami is a really nice green color, and as it's exposed to the sun and slowly matures, it gets lighter and lighter until it's sort of the color of hay. Because we caught this and I moved the desk in a timely manner, I'm pretty sure that the aging of this tatami is going to catch up with itself, so eventually we won't have this slightly darker green square. Overall, it's not that noticeable, but I'm glad I moved the desk, and I think within a season or two, the color will have evened out and you probably won't even be able to tell that this was there. Honestly, the only reason I pushed so hard to have this desk in the tatami room, knowing that you're not really supposed to set furniture on tatami, is because Airbnb has a special section for people who are traveling and working, and they require that you have an office workspace that is not in a pass-through room and I just wanted to have a room that we could say is a dedicated workspace and office. But back in New Orleans when we had our Airbnb, we had a lot more guests traveling and working at the same time than we do here in Japan. So since I moved the desk out here, I won't be able to say we have a dedicated office room. I will be able to say that we have a dedicated workspace or place for a laptop so I don't think that'll affect our listing very much. Since I moved the desk out of the tatami room to where this vintage keyboard was, I decided to put this keyboard just around the corner in the kitchen, and I think it fits here pretty well. By the way, if you didn't see our YouTube shorts or our stories about this keyboard, thanks to Peter for giving us this from his cool house on Hakata. While we're on the subject of breathability, 
I also bought these little wooden platforms that are designed to keep the bedding lifted up slightly off of the wooden shelves in Japanese style bedding closets. This allows the air to flow freely between the wood and the fabric so there's not moisture trapped there. After our heavy rain I did come in here and I noticed there was just a tiny bit of moisture underneath these lower blanket bags. So I bought platforms for the whole closet and now all of our bedding is lifted up off the wooden shelves and I think we averted any sort of crisis going on here. Thankfully these little wooden risers for breathability are really affordable. We bought these at the local island hardware store and Evan says that they were cheaper than he would have been able to make them himself. Also, their cedar, which is supposed to be the best for keeping fabrics in small enclosed spaces. I also made a few summer updates just to the organization of things in our bedding closet here. I moved the Han Tin winter jackets and the Snuggies and the throw blankets to the back of the closet and moved our cool soba pillows, which are designed for sleeping in the hot summer, to the front here. Just to be totally safe, I also got the little wooden platforms to put underneath our sitting pillows. And that's because pillows can also pull moisture out of the air and then trap that moisture between the pillows and the tatami or the wood that it's sitting on. And that would not be great for the pillows, the wood, or the tatami. I previously had the sitting pillows stacked in this corner here so they could easily be pulled out by guests and used when sitting at the kotatsu table but the pillows were trapping some moisture between themselves and the tatami, and we had the very beginning stages of some mildew appearing, so I definitely moved those immediately. I did make a few minor updates to the display cabinet in the living room here, with some additional things we found in the house, and I had time to clean up. An unexpected update that just came up is going to be repairing these tiles. We recently had a rainstorm and unfortunately left the window open and so that allowed some rain to come in and drip down behind them and pop them off the walls. Now we've had a phase two remodel planned for this house ever since we bought it and that has included repairing this bathroom. We might get to that this winter but we're not sure. At any rate, I'm not going to do a perfect job repairing these tiles because we're planning to completely redo this room in the future anyway. The issue is that these tiles were not back buttered when they were installed. Back buttering means you apply the mortar to the back of the tile and in this case it was just applied to the wall and so I'm not sure exactly how the physics of it all but basically when water gets down there's not a lot holding this tile to the wall because you can still see the back of it and everything the trademark so water gets in there and expands it and it just pops right off. So if you look down behind the tiles, you can see that they come in a 4x4 four four sheet and the whole thing is just lifted off and fallen off of the wall. And the only thing that's holding it up is the mortar or the, the grout between the tiles. And I suspect that because they're held together with some paper, a paper backing, I think that the paper backing has swollen and that has caused them to pop off. Here's a repair that was done before we purchased the house. It's a different color tile and as you can see, they didn't use the bevel tiles on the top here. Here's the repair job I did on my own when I was deep cleaning this bathroom and they started popping off in that way. You can see that I used the closest shade I could find and I think I did an okay job for my first uh, big tile repair project. A really unfortunate fact is that tile manufacturers in their infinite wisdom had decided at some point to stop making this size of tile and now we can only find a slightly larger size tile in stores. One of the great things about living on a tiny island though is that sometimes you find a tile warehouse that has just been purchased by a new winery and they let you go through and pick out all the tiles your heart could desire. So these are all the blues that mostly match. So these are 
assorted trim pieces in pink, white, and blue, which matches our colors here in, in the bathroom and kitchen, as well as the bathroom and kitchen at our other house. These are all the things you need to really make a complete tile job, so this is great. So that's an outside corner. I guess that's just a countertop edge or some other, just a trim piece. This is a type of bevel that they didn't have to do that repair. And here is the elusive double bevel. The most time consuming part of this job, which I did in the bathroom and I'm not gonna do here, hopefully, is going to be removing all of this mortar to get down to a smooth surface so that your tiles are not coming out wavy like this and you have a nice flat finish. But what I'm going to do is try and pull off as many tiles as I need to in one piece and then start to just get this wall stabilized. So I'm thinking this is the minimum I can get away with taking off and bolstering. It's a uh... It's an unsatisfying situation, but it is what it is. Again, we're just trying to temporarily stabilize this wall in uh, preparation for doing a, a good, good job later on. Well, that kind of looks like garbage, but it will at least keep the guests from knocking tiles off with their hands. Well, I can't stress enough the temporary nature of this patch job. But tomorrow I'll come back and redo the grout, and that'll get rid of all those dark lines. So a lot of our summer updates just consisted of moving things around so guests could get things they need in the heat easier than things they would need in the cold during winter. Most of the things we did buy were really affordable because we were able to find them at recycle shops. The only thing that was really expensive was the air conditioning units, but that was on our business plan all along to purchase them closer to when summer got here. So we had already budgeted for these. They cost approximately 100,000 Japanese yen, which is the equivalent of about 700 US dollars each. And again, we purchased two of them. And the reason that we were holding off on getting any more is because we're going to try and get the subsidy to help pay the costs of the rest of them. Or depending on how the summer goes, we may not get all the rest of the units, whether or not we get the subsidy, depending on how comfortable we're able to keep our space for guests. I would like, at a minimum, to get one more air conditioning unit for the upstairs bedroom, but whether or not we get the other units that were recommended to us, again, with or without the subsidy, That'll just depend on how the summer goes and how cool we're able to keep the house. We've gotten through our first winter and we kept our guests warm and happy, so now it's just a matter of getting through our first summer. I don't think any true Showa-era Japanese guest house would be complete without at least one tanuki out front. I picked this guy up at one of my favorite recycle shops, which is Rebirth in Onomichi. That brings the total cost of our summertime update to just under approximately 1500 US dollars. And the vast majority of that 1400 US dollars was the air conditioners and the rest were all the little things that I showed you. On a closing note, perhaps one faux pas that I am making as a foreigner running a guest house here in Japan is that I still have my wintertime slippers here at the guest house which are fuzzy and keep your feet warm, as opposed to the summertime slippers, which are cooler. So perhaps I will need to make an investment in some summertime slippers and then pack these fuzzy ones away until it gets chilly again. All right, Evie's just about to start doing the finishing touches on this grout so all those dark spots go away. Thanks for watching our summertime updates at Benton Guest House, and stay tuned. We've always got more coming your way. This is actually looking a lot better than Evan gives it credit for, and I'm totally happy with this for the next 6 to 18 months or whenever we do another update in this bathroom. Good job, Evie. Yeah, if you're happy, I'm happy.